Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to Evening Devotion. Before we start, um, I have made a video about a conversation I had earlier, and I'm still wrestling with whether or not I want to make it viewable. I posted it, I have not view made it viewable yet, because I don't know if it's even worth talking about. And if, I mean, if you want to read the conversation, if he hasn't deleted it, I blocked the guy because it was he was just looking for an opportunity for an argument. It was had nothing to do with glorifying God or talking about Scripture. It was he was right and everybody else was wrong, even when I proved him wrong multiple times. If you want to read the comment, you can go over to um, a couple of evening devotions back. Uh, it was Mark four four, I think, or something like that. Um, and I've pinned his comment. If you want to go read it for yourself. Um, it was nothing, had nothing to do with talking about what the word says or what was right and wrong or anything like that. Because even after I blocked him or even after I told him I wasn't going to comment anymore, he just kept on going. So if you guys want to see it, I'll post it. You can tell me in the comments if you actually like to watch that or want to watch it. It's just, for me, it was an example of what we're looking at today and how problematic the deception and not just the deception, but the, the amount of pride and hatred for the brethren that's in the church today. Now, we've all experienced it. I bet 2019, it was horrible. 2020, it was horrible. It's kind of laid down a little bit in some areas. But um, if nobody wants to watch it, I'm not going to make it public. Um, but if you want to read the comment, just go back a couple of evening devotions and you'll see it uh, pinned up there. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what the problem is. I don't know why people do this. I don't know why this is an issue. If somebody says something you disagree with, that is not an opportunity to instigate an argument. It doesn't glorify God. There's no purpose in it. And through the whole thing, I was okay until he started to deny the word of God. And then I really started to get mad because I take that personally. We have that word for a reason. That word was given to us by God so that we would have something to revert back to that would be a standard truth in this world when every other truth gets changed at people's whims. That word is all we have. You don't just automatically know about this. That word, this Bible, is all we have. It is, since we've never seen the Lord, since we don't have direct contact with him physically, this is our physical manifestation of him. Him in writing. In the volume of the book, it's written of me. That He said it. John said it. The word was with God. The word was God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. So if we don't count this word as something of authority, we don't count this word as true, but we sit and we deny it. But then, funny enough to me, and this is also frustrating, they deny the word is true, but then they quote from that very same word. Well, you can't deny it's true or say it has problems and then turn around and quote from it. Like you're proving your argument. You're proving your argument with evidence you say isn't legitimate. That doesn't make sense. So like, like if you guys want to see the video, I'll post it for you, to, for you to view it. If you don't, I'm not going to post it to view it because these arguments are nonsense and... I left the comment up. I don't know if he's deleted it or not. I left it up for you to be able to view it. It's just nonsense. It's just ridiculous that, that this is what we have to deal with on people that call themselves our brothers and sisters. It's the way of the world. I don't want to get into an argument about this. It's, there's no reason for it. It's, it's ridiculously dumb. It doesn't glorify God. However, I would love to sit down and talk about Scripture. Because from my way of looking at it, we're all wrong in many areas. We never get it exactly right. So we have to trust in the Lord on that. So if we disagree on something, let's dig deep and look at the evidence. And then we'll see for ourselves. If we choose not to receive it, well, that's between us and him. Not between me and the other person. Because he wrote the Bible, not me. All right, tonight we're going to be watching Psalm 47.4. He shall choose our inheritance for us. The whole verse says, he will choose our inheritance for us. The excellence of Jacob, whom he loves, Selah. Let's go up to the top here. God is king over all the earth. To the chief musician, a psalm of the sons of Korah. Oh, clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with a voice of triumph. For the Lord Most High is awesome. He is a great king over all the earth. 
He will subdue the peoples under us and the nations under our feet. He will choose our inheritance for us, the excellence of Jacob whom he loves, Selah. That's the one-third that's going to get saved after the tribulation or in the tribulation. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the shout, the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our king. Sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with understanding. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the people have gathered together. The people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is greatly exalted. And that's exactly the way it should be. Believer, if your inheritance be a lowly one, you should be satisfied with your earthly portion. For you may rest assured that it is the fittest for you. So this is something we forget to take into account when we look at what the Lord is doing. What the Lord is doing in each of our lives, what we've been given is fitting for us. It's appropriate for us, for our level, for our standard, for our position in this life. And so it will be perfect. See, one of the things of coming to the understanding of the Lord and how he does things, even if it's in a limited capacity, is we start to realize it's not about who can get the highest level of reward. It's just about loving God, loving Jesus Christ, waiting for him and watching for him. The reward is secondary. Being with the Lord is primary. Whatever he gives us, that's exactly what we deserve to get. Well, not even deserve. We don't deserve it. That, that's exactly what we are deemed to get. It may be a higher level, maybe a lower level. We don't know. It's not for us to say how we want it to be. I would imagine some people may get, get to heaven and be disappointed at what they have. Well, but you will be saved, according to what Jesus says. Many are going to lose a lot on that day. Many are going to suffer great loss, but will be saved. If you hold your standard at, at least I can see the Lord, at least I can be in his presence, at least I can stand in heaven with him, everything else is frosting on the cake. Unerring wisdom ordained your lot and selected for you the safest and best condition. A ship of large tonnage is to be brought up the river. Now, in one part of the stream, there is a sandbank. Should someone ask why does the captain steer through the deep part of the channel and deviate so much from a straight line? His answer would be, because I should not get my vessel into harbor at all if I did not keep to the deep channels. So it may be, you would run aground and suffer shipwreck. If your divine captain did not steer you into the depths of affliction where waves of trouble follow each other in quick succession. Some plants die if they have too much sunshine. It may be that you are planted where you get but little. You are put there by the loving husbandman. Because only in that situation will you bring forth fruit unto perfection. Do you hear what he's saying? You're saved in the place that you are saved in for a reason. And what he gives you there is what you need to be blessed, to bring forth fruit, to grow. Not in another area. See, not everybody should be in the pulpit. Not everybody should be in seminary. Not everybody should be a missionary. Not everybody should be uh, have a prison ministry. Not everybody should preach in the streets. But these ministries, when done in Christ, serve the same God. Some people are going to be poorer than others. Some people are going to be richer than others. Some people are going to be smarter than others. Some people are going to be more clever than others. Some people are going to have more abilities than others. All serve the same God. And he does that because he is working with you in that area. And he's doing something unique and special with you. And he will bring it to fruition. He will glorify you in that and he has already set before you what you need, what you're going to receive. We don't have a say-so in it. The only thing we do is walk in the truth. Stay in the presence of the Lord. Do not turn away. Remember this. Had any other condition been better for you than the one in which you are, divine love would have put you there. 
you are placed by God in the most suitable circumstances. And if you had the choosing of your lot, you would soon cry, Lord, choose my inheritance for me. For by myself, by my self-will, I am pierced through with many arrows, sorrows. Be content with such things as you have, since the Lord has ordered all things for your good. Is your life not as good as you think it should be? Maybe there's a reason for that. Maybe he's teaching you something. Maybe he's teaching you to be content with what you have. Because we are horrible about this. About constantly wanting something better, constantly wanting something more. But what if what you have is perfect for you? If you have rheumatoid arthritis or lupus and you're struggling to move and you're having issues and doing this and that, why would you buy a bigger house because you want a bigger house? Isn't it smarter to stay in the smaller one because it's easier to take care of and maintain? Maybe. Maybe. Would more room be a blessing or a curse? See, sometimes what we think we want is not what we need, and it would end up being a detriment to us. So sometimes the Lord puts us in a place where we're going to be perfectly comfortable, and he'll make us to prosper there. Take up your own daily cross. It is the burden best suited for your shoulder and will prove most effective to make you perfect in every good word and work to the glory of God. Down busy self and proud impatience. It is not for you to choose, but for the Lord of love. Trials must, trials must and will befall, but with humble faith to see love inscribed upon them all. This is happiness to me. And you may look at your situation currently and you may say, well, how can the Lord love me and put me here and, and him love me by putting me in this situation? What have you learned from that situation? What have you gained? Spiritually, physically, mentally. How is your outlook on things? Which direction are you heading? If you can look at those things and look at your situation and say, you know what, really, the Lord has really blessed me. I, I have everything I need. I don't want for anything. I'd like maybe some other stuff or better stuff, but I have everything. Do I really need more? And this was something that I always had taught myself. I always kind of had this as a thought, even before I was saved. I just want to be happy with what I can get my hands on. Whatever I can, I have, I'll be happy with it. Make it work. And if something better comes along, something better comes along. It is a blessing. Jesus said, the Father knows what you have need of. You need food and clothes. Everything else above that is a blessing. He provides everything. So if we're in a situation that other people look down upon, like many, many churches look down upon those who don't make a lot of money, look down upon those who are out there doing the dirty work, It may just be that that person is the one that needs to be teaching everybody because that person has seen things from a much different angle and the Lord is doing a miracle in their life, an incredible miracle because it's those people that are going to inherit the earth. Those meek people that everybody looks down on for being poor or destitute or whatever, they're the ones who are going to rule. They're the ones, the Bible says, who are going to shine brighter because the Lord is doing something much greater in their life. So if I'm poor, I'm happy. If I'm without, I'm, I'm okay with it. Because I know what the Lord has laid up for me is far greater than anything I could even want here. Than anything I could desire here. If I created a list of the most perfect things all that I could have all in one spot, I still wouldn't be happy with it. I know that I wouldn't be happy with it. Because there would still be something missing. See, I get to go to heaven and have Christ. Heaven isn't heaven without God. Heaven isn't heaven without Jesus Christ. I get to go to heaven and have him. That's all I want. That's all I need. Everything else is extra. When you learn to be happy with the simplest of things, everything else becomes surf and turf. Everything else becomes T-bone and eggs. Everything else becomes ribeyes and baked potatoes. So in this life, if you don't get exactly what you think you should get, stop. step back for a minute and take another look and say, okay, wait a minute. Am I really that bad off? 
Because even the richest person who looks at this stuff and looks at things from a biblical perspective to the poorest person, even living on the streets who looks at it from a biblical perspective, are, are they any different from each other? No. They're both men. They're both human. They're both God's children if they believe. They're both saved if they believe. And it doesn't matter how much money you have or how little money you have. You are still looked at the same and held in the same position as the other guy in Christ Jesus. None of us hold a higher position or a lower position than anybody. Jesus said this. In me there is no Jew or Greek. There is no bond or free. There is no rich or poor. There is no male or female. All are one in Christ Jesus. So like the guy that I had this conversation with today who was just blatantly ignorant, first of all, but then condescending in every instance, he held himself in very high regard. Well, what would make him higher, in a higher regard than me? What would make him, if he, even if he had learning, which you look at his sentence structure, you can see that he's struggling. I, I deduced from reading it on the video that he was probably drunk or, or high, and he did admit being a hippie enabler, but what, be that as it may. What would hold him in any higher regard than me or anyone else? Nobody. I don't look at any of you guys as being any less than me. Even if you don't have a YouTube channel, that doesn't matter to me. You're still my brethren in Christ. Even if you don't know as much as what I've been learning in the Bible, and I'm going to tell you right now, and I will freely admit, I don't know anything about this Bible. It is only what the Lord gives me that I share with you. I have no schooling in this. I don't know any of this. No training, no nothing. Nothing. I am nothing compared to what's going on here. I could never for one second look down on anyone else. Because my brethren are just like me and I'm just like them. No matter what the Lord is doing in our lives, that means nothing. It doesn't separate us. It doesn't come between us. If anything, it should bring us closer together. So if the world decides that we're less than what they think we should be because we don't look like them, act like them, talk like them, walk like them, eat where they eat and all that stuff. The difference is the world wants Starbucks. I'm happy with a Lipton tea bag and a cup of hot water. It's good enough for me. And I will be looked down upon for that. Thing is, at the end of the day, when everything is gone and all is said and done, and the two are sitting in the dirt together, both are exactly the same as everybody else sitting in the dirt. We were all made of clay. God breathed life into all, breathed life into all of us, and we're all going to die one day. The Lord has chosen our inheritance. The Lord has provided for us. What is going to be waiting on the other side? Because he's the one that does the work in us. He's the one that brings the fruit through us and from us. It all comes from him. We can do nothing. Because he can do everything. So I must look to him and put my trust in him. I must rely on him. Because if I didn't have him, I certainly would not be doing this. And I would not have done it for four years, even after all this, the assaults that I've had. And now are starting to get again. I wouldn't have 3,400 plus videos on my channel in four years. I don't know anybody else that does that. I don't know anybody else that's even come close to that. Even the bigger channels who have hundreds of thousands of people. I want Jesus Christ. I want whatever he wants for me. Because I know that's perfect. What I want, not perfect. What he wants for me, that's perfect. That's what I want. Because I know in that I will be happy. And I will be content. I will have peace. And I will have his love. And a place at his right hand. That's good enough for me. I love you all very much. I bless you all in Jesus' name, and I'll see you in the next video.